I am Gwen Bird, Dean of Libraries at Simon Fraser University. Welcome to the fourth event in our One Book, One SFU series. I hope you've all had a chance to read and enjoy our wonderful selected book for 2019, Son of a Trickster. <laughs> Tonight, we are delighted and honored to welcome Eden Robinson and Cherie Dimeline to SFU. I want to begin by acknowledging that we are gathered on the unceded traditional and current territory of the Coast Salish people, specifically the Squamish, Musqueam, and tsleil First Nations. It is our great privilege to live and work on this beautiful territory. For those of us who are settlers here, part of our role at this time in history in this place can be to support Indigenous sovereignty and resurgence. We can do this by making space to lift up and amplify Indigenous voices. For me, as a librarian, an obvious way to do this is by featuring inspiring challenging and wickedly smart Indigenous authors like the two we have here with us this evening. I have a few people to thank before we get uh, formally underway. I want to thank Chris Brayshaw and Pulp Fiction Books. Chris and his team will be available after the event for book sales in the lobby, and both Eden and Cherie will be signing their books right after the conversation just out here. I also want to thank all the staff and volunteers who have made tonight possible, and especially Baharak Yosefi, who put this yeah. evening's program together. <laughs> So a few housekeeping items. Our event is being filmed and photographed. If you don't wish to have your photo taken, please see one of our staff members and they will assist you and make sure that you're not filmed. There are all gender bathrooms available just at the back of the building on this floor. Uh, please put your cell phones to silent at this time, but if you would like to post on social media about the event, please tag SFU Library. We're on Twitter and Instagram. And now it is my pleasure to welcome back One Book, One SFU alum, <laughs> Dr. Ivan Coyote, who will introduce Cherie Dimeline. <laughs> There's a lot of love here. Yeah. <laughs> Ivan is the 2018-19 Writer-in-Residence and Shadbolt Fellow at SFU and the award-winning author of 11 books, the creator of four short films, and has released three albums that combine storytelling with music. Ivan is a seasoned stage performer and over the last 20 years has become an audience favorite at storytelling, writers, film, poetry, and folk music festivals from Anchorage to Amsterdam to Australia. Please join me in welcoming Ivan Coyote. <laughs> Hi everybody. Um, it's really a great honor uh, to be here tonight and um, share the stage even for a brief time with both of these two women who uh, both are very dear to me. Um, and I've been asked to introduce uh, Cherie Demeline. So the first time I really met, we'd seen each other a couple of times here and there, but the first time I really met and talked to Cherie Demeline was last summer in the Air Canada Lounge in the Toronto <laughs> Pearson Airport. <laughs> It was full of blue-suited businessmen and taupe-suited businesswomen and two tattooed writers. <laughs> Both of us on our way to Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan for a writer's festival. And we recognized each other somehow. Uh, she introduced herself. We both grabbed coffees and sat down. And that is where the stories started. And by the time we pulled up in the rental car outside of the hotel in, in uh, Moose Jaw, I felt like I had known her since grade eight. 
and I felt like we were driving a bus full of both of our families. Her mother and my grandmother in particular were present in that car ride and that weekend. Stories have that power, and Cherie Demeline is one of the finest storytellers that I know. She's a Métis author and editor from the Georgian Bay community. Her award-winning fiction has been published and anthologized internationally. She was named the first writer in residence in the Aboriginal literature for the Toronto Public Library. She also coordinates the annual Indigenous Writers Gathering in Toronto, the Marrow Thieves, which won, among numerous other awards, the Governor General's Award for English Language Children's Literature and the 2017 Kirkus Prize in Young Adult Literature category is Demoline's newest dystopic sci-fi novel aimed at young adults in which global warming has devastated the planet. So maybe not so sci-fi. <laughs> and the indigenous people of North America are hunted for their bone marrow. Cherie Demoline is unstoppable. She is currently one of the executive producers and the writer for the first season of the Marrow Thieves TV adaptation with Vancouver-based <laughs> Vancouver-based Indigenous-owned Thunderbird Entertainment. And last year, she signed a four-book deal for two adult novels with Random House Canada and two YA novels with Penguin Random House Canada Young Readers. Her next novel, Empire of Wild, is set in the Georgian Bay area of Lake Huron, where Demoline grew up. I always want to look at the ceremony of the everyday, she says about this new book, which I am so excited to read. It's about breaking open the mundane to see the shine inside of it. For Sheree Demoline, writing is about survival and resistance. This resonates for me very deeply, and I am so honored to introduce you tonight to Cherie Demoline. Thank you. Wow, uh, thank you, Ivan. Um, Ivan is the, among you know, many, many talents and beautiful things, is a perfect gentleman. Every time I am in town, they offer to cook me a chicken, <laughs> which is uh, which is you know the way to an indigenous woman's heart. Like, let me kill something and cook it for you. And uh, and it has always been there uh, when I needed them. Um, we've had some. We've been in some events uh, that weren't always friendly, uh, then and that were difficult. And Ivan was always there. Uh, offering me water, because I always forget to bring my water. I have like 400 reusable water bottles at home. I, I use them once, so I'm not helping anyone's la landfill. Um, and also to just, just be there and, and let, me, uh, let me be weak. And so thank you so much. Ivan, who also uh, has this talent of making me feel like a complete lazy ass, because how are you on your 12th book now? The 12th book will be out this fall. Yes, Revenge Dinner, yes. So I get to introduce uh, one of my favorite people in the world, my very good friend, Eden Robinson. And so I was looking uh, online, and I was looking at some of the other uh, events that we've done where I you know, did her bio, um, and uh, I just thought, I'm gonna read the one from Son of a Trickster because it is the best bio ever in any book. I, if you haven't read it, it's part of your you know, $29.95 that you spent to get the book because it's a masterpiece. So uh, I'm gonna read it. So, Heisla Hetzluck, novelist Eden Robinson is the author of a collection of short stories written when she was a goth called Chalk Lines. Her two previous novels, Monkey Beach and Blood Sports, were written before she discovered she was gluten intolerant <laughs> and tend to be quite grim. The latter being especially gruesome because halfway through writing the manuscript, Robinson gave up a two-pack-a-day cigarette habit. And the more she suffered, the more her character suffered. <laughs> It's true, it's a brutal book. Um, <laughs> Son of a Trickster was written under the influence of pan-fried tofu and nutritional yeast, which may explain things, uh, but probably doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> 
And the book I found it was just uh, long listed for the Stephen Leacock Humor Award. The second book. The second book. Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. No worries, no worries, no worries, no worries. Look at that. You oh think if God. someone was going to get things wrong, it wouldn't be the person moderating. <laughs> That's terrible. Oh, my God. I'm still stuck. I have read the second book, but I'm still now it's stuck on the serious. first book. It's very serious. <laughs> Do you find that odd when, when you think something is funny? Like, I remember writing um, my first book, and I thought, oh, this book is hilarious. <laughs> And then I went to Australia, and they put me on a panel that, I mean, I don't know what the actual title was, but the subtitle was basically How Not to Kill Yourself <laughs> When You're Writing Horrifically Depressing Things. I literally was on the panel with somebody who wrote about serial killers. Um, there was a woman writing about the uh, sex trafficking of children, and somebody who wrote about wars, and then me. <laughs> I thought my book was funny. <laughs> Has that happened? Do you get? Or do you think that something's funny and then someone's like, "Oh, I feel so bad. Are you okay?" <laughs> well, uh, uh, some of the tricks are. I thought you know it was a, like, "Can you guys hear me?" Okay. Yeah. <laughs> She's very shy. Hello. <laughs> Uh, I thought it was like, you know, the lightest book that I've, mm. I've written and I've had people go, oh, it must have been so hard to write that. I was like, yeah, it was, you know, in, in Eden Robinson level of darkness. It's <laughs> <laughs> beige. Oh, beige. It's beginner. <laughs> <laughs> I think in Canlit, I'm, I'm like mid-dark. Okay. Like, you know, David Adams Richards, Mercy Among the Children, that would be like full dark. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you know, yeah. So I don't think of myself as like a terribly dark writer, but yeah. 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 Uh, sometimes when I go to events, people are very disappointed when they see me. Because <laughs> 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 you know the books are you know mildly dark, and then uh -huh. they're expecting someone that dark. Um, uh, okay, yeah, no, I have the yeah. same problem, but it's when people hear that they're coming to see an indigenous author, and then I walk out. Oh. So kind of about <laughs> darkness. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So for 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 the first short story collection that I wrote, uh, Trap Lines, yeah. uh, like I I was pretty emo. <laughs> 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 but first, but I was also like horrifically shy, uh, and I needed gimmicks to do my first readings. Okay. Uh, so there there's this novella called uh, Contact Sports. <laughs> Where there's a psychopathic cousin torturing, you know, his his younger cousin. Uh -huh. And for some reason, I thought the best way to do a reading would be to make puppets of them. <laughs> <laughs> so there's this horrible non-consensual tickling scene. <laughs> time to memorize it and yeah. then to act it out with puppets. <laughs> okay. And then it was it was through like uh, I think that was the Elliott Bay bookstore. Okay. And I've never been invited back. <laughs> Please tell me someone filmed it. No, this was this, this was like pre internet. Oh yeah. Oh we, we, you could get away with puppet shows about non consensual tickling. It's uh I one of my favorite personal memories of, of the book was um, during one of the Giller readings that was in Vancouver actually. Um, uh, Eden couldn't make it, so so they said we need someone to uh, read her work. Um, and so I said, Okay, I'll do it. Right? Like I'll do it, I will fly in there and be the superhero. And I was terrified because it's the Gillers and it's very fancy. They had someone do my makeup. That's when I knew something was up, right? They're like, they gave me <laughs> eyebrows. I looked terrified and shocked. Um, and so I went and, uh, and I get up there and they, you know, so everyone's very fancy. And so I start off with, you know, a joke. I'm like, 
it's really weird reading someone else's work. It's like making out with someone else's husband. And they're like, <laughs> and, <laughs> right? There's like couples sitting there like. Right. So I remember, I remember the part I had to read, and I and I decided I needed to have a Giller voice. <laughs> Because you can't just read at the Gillers, you have to like enunciate at the Gillers. And so the line I had to read was, Gonna miss you, Jared whispered in her ear. Baby lifted a leg and farted. <laughs> <laughs> you know, trying to be very Giller-esque about farting was, uh, was really fun. Um, <laughs> It was great. And then I had to read... Um, I want you to narrate the book. <laughs> do it! I will do it, but someone has to draw eyebrows on me first. Um, so I think, like for me, and I, and I know we get asked this question a lot, but I, I really need to know, what was the impetus for this, this book? Like, what was the... Was it a traditional story? Was it a nightmare? Were you... Were you high? Just tell me. What happened? <laughs> Okay, let's yeah, do it. Yeah, no, um, it was a lot of, well, I hadn't actually, uh, I've been having this really frustrating thing happen where I would write 100 pages hmm. into novels and then it would die. Mm -hmm. And nothing, the no exercise that I did could uh, could push me past that point. Mm -hmm. Like, it, so, so I'd had uh, three novels die. Like they just they just refused to move after a hundred pages, so I you know I had a full book written about, uh, but it wasn't related to each other. <laughs> <laughs> like I had the third book uh, for the the blood sports trilogy, like it was oh. death sports, <laughs> <laughs> but it only went to a hundred pages and then it just wouldn't go any further. Yeah. And with me, that usually means I have to think about the concept more, or uh, there's there's something I'm missing. Mm. Uh, so with uh, so I started writing a trashy bank council romance. Yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it was getting really complicated. Um, As they do. <laughs> Someone's your cousin. You don't know what to do. Yes. <laughs> well, the um, the so the two the two lovers are uh, the environmental manager who worked for the AFN until he became disillusioned with the politics. Uh -huh. uh, decided to move home to help his community. Uh -huh. uh, so his wife divorced him because she didn't want to leave Ottawa, uh, and started dating a guy from the Ottawa Senators farm team. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Kids are like crazy about hockey, so they've kind of abandoned him. Okay. Uh, he's been carrying a torch for the housing manager uh, since high school. She's married to the chief operating officer, uh, whose brother is the chief counselor. Okay. Uh, so when, uh, so she's so they've been married for a very long time. Uh -huh. uh, he's always cheated on her, and it's a you know it's kid him out. Everyone knows everyone else's business. Mm -hmm. um, she loves him more than he loves her. So, uh, so when they finally, well, when her and the environmental manager finally hook up, uh -huh. uh, you know, uh, there are some writers who have the gift of writing sensual scenes and yes. erotic scenes. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I lack this gift. <laughs> <laughs> so I've decided to go with my strengths and write, you know, uh, angry, awkward sex scenes. <laughs> yeah. So they finally hook up in the, the photocopy room. Uh -huh. uh, and that's, this is how angry they are. It's, you know, if you know the highs of the nation band council, it's open concept. Uh, <laughs> and there's security cameras everywhere. <laughs> it's monitored by the health manager. <laughs> Uh, so the different layers of the, you know, so then their uh, their kids were in there, their cousins were, well, and you know, 
it, it started off with just them, uh -huh. but then it started branching out because you know everyone was talking about you know oh she's finally getting back at her husband. No, 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 they've been you know they've been in love since high school. Oh, I'm pretty. So so all the different viewpoints started coming, and then the backstory started coming, and it was just like a, a giant mess. Hmm. So I went, well, you know, okay, I'm going to take a break from this and <laughs> write it. Uh, and at that time, uh, my, my niblets were visiting, my niece and my nephew, mm -hmm. and they were, uh, dad was trying to tell them, uh, we get stories, our, our transforming raven, our, our trickster. Mm -hmm. And uh, I used to love those when I was growing up, because they were always crazy, mm -hmm. and they were always funny, and you know, the cousins and the aunts and uncles would compete with each other to tell it funnier and faster and wilder, mm -hmm. and uh, they, didn't, they didn't see the humor in it. So I wanted to write a, a trickster story set in the now with references that they could understand so that they could see. So it was only gonna be 10 pages, <laughs> Boy, you got tricked. <laughs> like, I'm pretty sure it's just a trilogy. <laughs> it is a trilogy. I'm because uh, I want to get back to the trashy band no. council romance. Well, we want you to get back to the trashy <laughs> band council romance. <laughs> So I have to say, so I picked up the book the first time. I've read it a few times since because I'm just I'm in love with, with the style and, and just the poetry and the language, um, and especially this poetry, page one, um, when we meet Maggie when she calls somebody a cuntosaurus <laughs> on page one. I remember opening it and I'm like, oh my god. This is my friend Eden, and she's the nicest woman. I love her. Oh my god! <laughs> but it's the perfect introduction to Maggie because really, she just does not care. Um, you know, and she's yeah. just tough. And you know what? I have to say, you make her so beautiful and 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 sharp that there's a moment where she tucks her cigarette into the corner of her mouth <laughs> and puts Jared in a headlock, and I was like. That is so sweet. <laughs> she loves that boy. <laughs> but when you're writing, do you do you have readers in mind? Do you think do you ever come to a moment where you're like, maybe I can't put like a swear word and a dinosaur together and make a new <laughs> Do you think about that? Or do you just kinda go for it? <laughs> uh, well, this was an unusual book because I wrote it uh, at four in the morning. Uh, four to five in the morning for a year. Wow. And uh, if you're if you're stuck, and you know you can't you can't push past your inner editor, I highly recommend writing at four. Uh, your inner editor is not awake. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. So it just you know it, it poured out. Um, uh, yeah, I've been trying to, like, trickster drift, I wrote between 7 and 8. Okay. Uh, and the last one, I was trying to push it to between 10 and 11, but it's... I love yeah. the science of this. Yeah. <laughs> it's an experiment. How many times can I swear between certain hours? <laughs> well, you know, when I was, when I was growing up, uh, you know, fuck was an adjective. It right? was just, you know, it yeah. was just... Uh, so when I went to university, I had to stop swearing. <laughs> <laughs> you showed them. <laughs> Watch what I can do with swear words. <laughs> it's out in the writing. It's no. like, it's still there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's still there. And uh, I, I find it challenging with readings now, because you know, I, I have trained myself not to swear. <laughs> <It's> like, I, <laughs> the first reading I went to, it was your dad's birthday. We Aww. we had you had the entire theater sing happy birthday yeah. to him, and then you proceeded to do a reading where um, Eden decided to censor herself because there were a couple of kids in the audience, and so the reading went like this. Um, oh, it was blood sports too. <laughs> it was like he walked into the house and there was. <laughs> And 
he said, what the are you doing? <laughs> and I was, so people were like, is she? I'm like, no, she's normally a really great tutor. <laughs> she's just leaving out the swear words. She's not that nervous. <laughs> But it was, yeah, it was really interesting. And so now when I, when I go to readings, I'm like, oh, I wonder if she's going to try and censor herself. It's like listening to like, a, you know, like 21 Savage on the radio or like Lil Wayne when they try and play the radio edit of hip hop and you're like, that is not with that. that I know there's more than three words in that song. <laughs> Like a, a beat thing, so I can beat. Oh, myself. we should yeah. get one. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. I love it. So why didn't we do that? We need to really get together before we do okay. the next one. Yeah, okay. and come up with a beeper thing. <laughs> I, the best. So the last time we were was Toronto. The last time we were together, or was it was Sheila? I, I just called Sheila Rogers, Sheila. Like her <laughs> friends. Is Sheila? Uh, Vancouver Writers Festival. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, the tribute to, to Richard. Yeah, yeah, to Richard Wagamese. Yeah. Which was, in, that was, that's what it took for us to not laugh for an hour, yeah. literally, yeah. was Eden and I um, being asked to do a tribute to Richard Wagamese. But then we had funny Richard Wagamese stories. Yeah. The first half hour was. <laughs> yeah, and then we were like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, because I remember the first time I met Richard Wagamese, he came into my office at the Friendship Center I was working at, and he said, uh, "Hey, do you have any white pages I can borrow? I'm looking for someone. Not white people, though." <laughs> <laughs> um, but we were in Toronto, and so Eden and I purposely, because we know each other so well, I'm like, I'm not going to tell you anything I'm going to ask you. And she's like, yeah, go for it. I don't mess. I'm not afraid of you. <laughs> so I said, all right. So then we got on stage, and I said, Eden, tell us about the time you slept your way through Scotland. <laughs> and she did! <laughs> Okay, we'll put so. the um, <laughs> Scottish penis aside. Uh, so in unrelated uh, news, um, I have some questions that I got from uh, younger kids that were interested in, in authors and writing. And so um, one of the questions that was asked of me is, um, what did you do with your first advance? Which I really laughed at, because my first advance was $200, so I went to 7-Eleven. <laughs> I did. I went to 7-Eleven and I bought beef jerky, which was the most expensive thing you can buy, right? Beef jerky at 7-Eleven is like $11. I was like, I'm an author now, so I'll take two. Keep the change. <laughs> recently on traveling. <laughs> to Scotland? <laughs> uh, the first one was a, a trip out on the Mayan Road. Oh, wow. Because uh, I'd always wanted to see the temple. So it was six weeks and just, yeah. And uh, let's see. Yeah, so, but always, and I always regretted it because, you know, I could have had a condo in Vancouver and been a millionaire. <laughs> cheaper in the 90s. <laughs> uh, but then, you know, now that I'm getting creakier, I, I'm very glad I traveled as much as I did. Yeah. Because yeah. Yeah. I could not make it up the temples now. <laughs> I, I learned two things with that question. One, one was that, you know, that you have traveled a lot, and the second is that your advance is way fucking more impressive than mine. <laughs> First book, like how old were you, and what was it? Did, what, did you publish the first book that you wrote? Uh, the first book that I wrote was uh, Tropic Lines, and that was uh, 
the first story in the collection I wrote in a week. Uh, and the novella I wrote over 10 years. <laughs> uh, and I consider that my apprentice novel because it was so relentlessly awful. It was. I love that. Like nothing I did made it any better and I was obsessed with it and I couldn't get it right. So, you know, I changed genders. I changed the time, I changed uh, from like first person to third person to a yeah, very brief stint at second person, <laughs> which was, which was yeah, you know, it's sort of to read like really bad porn. <laughs> I made it linear, I circled it up, I did everything. Uh, and then when I was in my master's, I finally, um, you know, uh, Keith Ballard was my thesis advisor and he asked me three questions. And those three questions just like laid out everything I needed to do with the, that novella. So um, he was very patient because I had been writing like a, the proto version of Monkey Beach. Uh, so three, three months before I was supposed to hand in my thesis, I switched it. <laughs> to the short story collection. <laughs> I owe him all the fruit baskets. <laughs> That was the, the collection that I uh, showed to the woman who would eventually be my agent. Uh, and the, the publisher loved all the stories, except the last one, uh, Terminal Avenue, which is my, uh, my response, my, sci <laughs> my, my sci-fi Aboriginal bondage story. Uh, that re re reaction to, you know, at the time Oka was, had, we had the one year anniversary for Oka. And we just had the, like, the Fraser River Salmon Wars. And uh, so it was, you know, that was my response to it. I don't know if it's a good response, but uh, so we put Queen of the North in it instead. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so that was my very first uh, publication. And then Monkey Beach was. Uh, the first novel. And who was your, did, did you, have you always had the same editor? Or it's changed uh, over time? It's changed over time. Uh, I, uh, track lines was weird because we were trying something different. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we were, we were trying to have multiple editors because it was all, it was going to come out in many different countries at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had five different editors wow. <laughs> and three sub editors. Uh, and the amount of notes for that novel is just uh, mind and soul crushing. Yeah. Uh, and so for Monkey Beach, I insisted on having a Canadian editor. Um, and it was yeah you know, the the yeah the the first version of Monkey Beach. Uh, you know I, I I went into it very uh, confident that I knew what I was doing. <laughs> As we do. <laughs> I got this. <laughs> and, you know, I did. <laughs> I got really confident because I finished a novella, so of course I can write a novel. Uh, and um, so there was, you know, there wasn't, there wasn't really a main character. Uh, there wasn't really a plot. <laughs> those, are, those are important, maybe. <laughs> you need those. So, so it was like a 500 page uh, mood poem. And lots of people drowning. Uh, <laughs> the German editor really liked it. Uh, <laughs> but everyone else was like, you know, okay, so. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so, so once we fine-tuned a few things, yeah. Rewrote. Rewrote. Once we rewrote, rewrote it, yeah. Rewrote rewrote, yeah. Rewrote yeah. I think that's important. I, I like to talk about those things because there's always uh, writers, emerging writers, aspiring writers, 
um, who, who you know, sort of listen and, and come to events. And I, I just always want to acknowledge that, like, it, it's never, even Eden Robinson gets things <laughs> wrong. <laughs> and things need to be rewritten. And I, I wrote um, The Marrow Thieves, um, I wrote it in six weeks, and people are always Whoa. like, that, except that it, I, I rewrote it 11 times after. <laughs> so sometimes I leave that out. Like at the Gillers, I, like, I've never been nominated, but I show up because they invite me to the party, and it's an open bar, so I go. Um, but you know, when they ask me, I'm like, oh, it took six weeks? How long did your novel take? <laughs> <Cassie Adoyan. laughs> <laughs> and I leave out the fact that it was rewritten 11 times. Um, yeah, but I think that's really important. And also um, that you have the right editor, the right person to read yes. it and work. So I recently, um, it was mentioned, I signed on with uh, Penguin Random House. And so I, I gave my uh, agent, um, it was a nightmare for him because I, I sort of said, well, I want um, Ann Collins cause, because she's Eden Robinson's editor and we have similar like dark and traditional stories and what that means yeah. to carry traditional stories and our responsibilities and you know and people sort of try and categorize the work well it's magic realism no it's <laughs> speculative no it's, it's they have no idea so I said you know I want to go with uh, Ann Collins and he said okay do me a favor do not walk into this meeting and say oh no you have it it's Ann I'm, I'm gonna give the book to you <laughs> make them fight for it and I was like that feels dishonest <laughs> he's like this is why I'm your ed your agent please just be quiet <laughs> but that was the entire thing was I really loved Aww. the work that she did with you and in yeah. your stories and it, yeah. it's about that thing right because I mean, I've heard that, you know, that your work is magic realism, speculative, horror. Yeah. Do you even think about genres when you're writing or do you just give her yeah. and let them sort of... <laughs> 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 uh, for in the morning, you're not really... Uh, <laughs> you do not care. You do not care. Like, coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Machine work. <laughs> I love that you're a caveman at four in the morning. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, yeah, until like, like the first two cups of coffee, and I was like, okay. And then you're quite eloquent. So do you write like the the clumsy sex scenes when you're like a caveman, and then you get out and you're like, I'm talk about the universality of love. Um, no, that's espresso. Oh. <laughs> You need the good coffee. You do. Um, so what do you, I'm going to ask you a process question, okay. but it also involves drugs. So, um, <laughs> so microdosing is the key. Microdosing. <laughs> oh, do tell. Forget about the book. Microdosing. <laughs> okay, here's my question, but we're going to get back to microdosing. Okay. Um, so when people ask me about my process, I always use you as my example. Uh -huh. I, <laughs> I've literally done interviews where people are like, so what is, you know, what is your office? What is your process? And I'm like, well, I know Eden Robinson. <laughs> because Eden Robinson posts these pictures of her like friggin' pottery barn area, like where things are perfect <laughs> and like color coordinated. And she has like all these tabs that are just line up perfectly. You know when you put like tabs in your in your work, but then they all sort of clump. No, hers are like a fan of <laughs> like of colors, and she has like calendars from the years that she's writing in. So like she'll have a calendar of like 1989 up on the wall, and she's like, okay, so if it was a Wednesday, I know if I say it's two days later, it's Friday. <laughs> because. Because, and especially because I wrote YA, I can never say what my real process is, which is like pajamas, vodka, and terror. <laughs> so I'm always like, I don't know. Go see what Eden is doing. <laughs> so Coffee <it's>, good. <laughs> there you go. We get the truth. But in terms of process, I was in uh, I was in Peru recently, and I was part of a I was listening to a panel because I don't and I was doing a very bad job because I don't speak Spanish, so I was like, <laughs> right? You know when you have that, right? And you like grow the imaginary beard. You're like, <laughs> uh, so I was sitting there, and but 
you know, the translator then helpfully was like, oh, she was saying that she spent five years uh, pretending or, you know, emulating the life of a heroin addict to write uh, this book about a heroin addict. And I was like, wow, that's commitment. Yeah. So then I immediately thought of my friend Eden Robinson. And so now I need to know, did you do mushrooms <laughs> while you were writing this book? <laughs> we, we need to know. <laughs> If you were eating mushrooms <laughs> while you wrote this book? Uh, no. No? <laughs> I think <you> cheated! <laughs> would, you, would you admit it at SFU if you did? Uh, mushrooms don't really have any effect on me. Oh. Um, yeah, uh, magic mushrooms are indigenous to uh, the, you know, the highest of territory. So they were used in, in various circumstances. Uh, and I always felt very cheated because everyone was having these lovely, you know, these lovely trips. And, right. and I was like, yeah, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I've got that peculiar brain chemistry that just, uh, I Or else... like your ancestors were like, not today, Eve. <laughs> <laughs> this is sacred. <laughs> right? Don't misuse the medicine. Medicine for writing. <laughs> no, no hallucinations for you. Oh uh, yeah, because I'm I'm like wildly allergic to THC. Are you? Yeah, I immediately start vomiting. So what? Yeah, yeah, it's it's really pissed me off when it was legal. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, now I can I can finally do like you know, uh, and and then I discovered that I'm wildly allergic to it. So. I can do CBD oil, but yeah. that's about it. Okay, so, microdosing. Yeah. Are we talking about LSD here? Um, I, yeah, LSD. Uh, again, that's another drug that makes me vomit. So. What? Any kind of gluten? Life has been cruel. <laughs> it's just a sober ride for you, my friend. <laughs> Your path. <laughs> you are not allowed to stray. <laughs> Your ancestors are powerful, man. Holy. Oh my goodness. Um, what do you think about in terms of? Because I'm curious. So there's it's three books. At the beginning, once you took a break and you were just going to write ten pages, I'm just going to write ten pages of this story um, trilogy. At, at the beginning, when you sort of figured out it wasn't just going to be a small story, that yeah. it was going to be a book, did you plan out the three books, or did you sort of write one and go, oh, damn it, there's more? <laughs> I know it worked like, like kombucha, like, you know, when you have the mother and it just kind of, you know, expands. <laughs> I started writing the you know short story. Okay, it's a novella. Okay, it's a novel, mm -hmm. uh, and it started when my main character moved to Vancouver, mm -hmm. uh, and then I and then towards the end of that version, mm -hmm. um, I, I was starting to have kid the kid about flashbacks came in, and they're getting longer. And my first readers were like, well. Okay, you have 50 pages of Vancouver, and then 50 pages of Kitimat, and then 50 pages of Vancouver, and then 50 pages of Kitimat, and it's slowing down the ending. Uh, we don't know where we are. We don't know, like, as a, you know, it's getting, it was super awful. <laughs> and they liked the characters, but they were just very confused about where they were and what they were doing. Uh, so, uh, so I decided to clump all the Kitimat section together. So I stuck that novella like, like in the last third of the first novel. So he, you know, he gets to Vancouver, you know, stock, you know, ghosts, you know, blah blah blah. And then there's like a, a hundred page flashback to get him out. <laughs> They wind up back in Vancouver. <laughs> That's what I showed Anne. <laughs> I was like, oh. Did she do that thing where?
before when you turn in something bad where she takes you out for lunch? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, when she's like, you, you know what? Why? Yes! <laughs> Let me take you to lunch. I'm like, oh, fuck. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so she made a suggestion that since, like, everything was so, like, all, there were many complicated elements, uh, they were going, uh, they were, you know, it was, it was going to be a challenging novel anyways. Mm. Maybe we should simplify one of them, like, you know, like the... The, the time, maybe we could make it linear. <laughs> Start with the simple things. Make it, make it go one direction. Uh, so, uh, so I went, oh wow, linear, I never thought of that. <laughs> uh, so, so, yeah, so my, my writing process is very messy, but then, when the editing comes in, that's when... That's the, when you get fancy and post pictures? Yeah, yeah. When it all looks I'm neat. Told. It's Instagram. It is! <laughs> it's like a Pinterest inspiration board. Ian Robinson's office. <laughs> it's like, you know, when they, like you post the, the selfie before you get the sunburn. Right. It's that kind of thing. It's okay. that kind of thing. It's, okay. it's, um, so... I divide the entire book into scenes, uh, and <laughs> like physically, uh, I'll print it out single sided, and then uh, decide like you know okay this is scene one this is scene two and then just start chopping it up and uh, sort of moving it all over the apartment. For Monkey Beach, I was pinning the scenes to my my walls, so there are push pins like. Through the entire apartment, <laughs> I did like six drafts. <laughs> well, things like the wind is coming in. You're like, it's chilly in your apartment, Eden. <laughs> I did not get my damage deposit back. <laughs> and that was the way when I was smoking two packs a day. <laughs> yeah. So you just smoke coming out of the holes in your apartment, <laughs> like. <laughs> Do you remember those like those jelly <laughs> those jelly max? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, oh I, I had a like I had a so like a, I had a turquoise jelly mac. Ugh. And I had to bring it into the computer place twice because I was smoking so much. I was tarring up the fan. Oh. <laughs> 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 Uh, so once I chop it into scenes, uh... <laughs> you guys should see my lungs. Anyway, <laughs> uh, then you start to flag like, like you. Uh, in in all my novels, I've always been like inside the main character's head. Right. Like it's narrated single per uh, first person or limited omniscient. It's just right. it's always. Uh, so I think one of my challenges, oh, well, I'm going off, but. <laughs> it's your hour. <laughs> Please. Um, but, you know, so, so when I'm flagging, when I, uh, usually um, what I'm looking for is like, uh, like if you have like uh, a bunch of very long scenes, uh, you can physically see it when you cut it into scenes. So you'll see like the the big information and expositional dump <laughs> <laughs> that you took for this 80 pages. <laughs> <laughs> and you might need to break that up. <laughs> <laughs> or you could or you start to see where the threads are missing. Right. Like you've introduced this character. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then they're dropped for 100 pages, and then they come back in. Right. Uh, so you may need to remind the reader that, you know, there's this character that's going to play an important part later. Or not, you know, or you combine a couple of characters, and then you, uh, then you need to put all the information correctly in your search and replace. Or <laughs> <laughs> it's a very important writerly device. Search and replace. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, because um, I think Monkey Beach was the first time I'd had to write to a deadline, and 
like the two packs was my starting point. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, yeah, well, I was living in North Van at that time, and I was right beside the the reserve. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, there there was a lot of places that you know kind of sold bootleg cigarettes. Oh yeah. Uh, okay. And they were the only ones that were open. Uh, you know, like when I was riding between ten and two in the morning. So hold on, you were smoking two packs of Res smokes a day. <laughs> <laughs> How do you not have <laughs> <laughs> it sounded like bubble wrap. <laughs> Sorry, I found that funny. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I have tried to quit like 17 times. Yeah. Um, and uh, my GP said, well, you know, I, I think we're going to have to talk about oxygen tanks. And that's, that's when my vanity kicked in. <laughs> I can't be dazzle an oxygen tank. You know, it's, it's super hard to flirt when you've got an oxygen tank. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> I love that. That's, that's your takeaway from today. <laughs> Quit smoking because it's really hard to flirt with oxygen. <laughs> Uh, an oxygen tank. An oxygen <laughs> tank. Right, right. Well, then they've got the cute little ones. Do and they? Yeah. And you can yeah. sort of make an accessory out of it? You know, you could put it, like, you could get one of those, like, really styling fanny packs. Oh, <laughs> yay. Okay. Just say it's like a really new vape. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So, Eden, I, when I'm writing, um, I have to be really careful about what I'm, reading because I find, like I, I read so much and I love reading and I get into it and then suddenly, you know, halfway through my book, it sounds like uh, Hunter S. Thompson has taken over the wheel <laughs> and I reread it and I'm like, what has happened? And then I'm like, oh, because I was reading Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas and suddenly my character is like, you know, falling into a casino and <laughs> making bad choices. Um, but I love, but I can't stop reading. So uh, what the book that I'm reading right now, I'm just interested in what you are working on and what, and what you're reading. So two parts. Um, but right now I'm reading uh, Dion Brent's The Blue Clerk. Okay. All right. I have to tell you my Dion Brent story. So I uh, have this last year traveled a lot and I've met a, a lot of people. Um, I very, like, unashamedly got a picture with Salman Rushdie in uh, Colombia, I think we were, and oh, yeah. put it on my Facebook like we were pals. Yeah. <laughs> we, were, we were not. Yeah. I um, ran off with his girlfriend during this party. I brought her back. I brought her back. But he was sort of chasing us around, tapping his his watch, because he's very old. I don't know if you know this, but I was like, holy shit, you're really old. And he was having his watch being like, we have an early flight. We have an early flight. And so we'd be like, OK. And then as soon as someone came to talk to him, we'd run and go to the bar. Um, but anyways, that's not the story. So Dion Brett. So I've met all these writers, and I'm sort of like, you know, they're writers. They're cool people. I, Zadie Smith, I was a giant ass. I couldn't make eye contact with her. I was like. Because how do you have any right to be that uncommonly beautiful and that brilliant? What is this? She's got these freckles even. I'm like, what? And then, and she, she's, she wears sensible shoes and looks hot. I'm like, that's not, that's unfair. But for some reason, Dion Brandt is my, I can't even, she comes into the room and I can't, I have no, vo I'm like, what? So we were here for the Vancouver Writers Festival and she was coming. And I was like, I'm going to talk to her because I'm curating part of this festival. <laughs> so I'm a big deal. And I can talk to her. It's no big deal. I can talk to Dion Brandt. So we're on Granville Island. And I see her walking from the hotel and she's by herself. And I'm like, here it is. I'm going to talk to Dion Brandt. I'm going to do it, right? So I'm like, oh, I'm so I was smoking. So I'm like, I can't let Dion Brandt see me smoke. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm good. Hey, she's not going to know I smoked. So I walk up the street, 
and she's there, and then she gets closer, and like everything goes into like Beyonce slow motion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and her hair is like this perfect swoop, right? And her blouse is like ironed. Who irons things? <laughs> and so she gets close, and I'm like, here it is. I'm gonna talk to Dion Brandt. It's happening right now. And I stepped off the curb and felt <laughs> in front of Dion Brandt. And so she goes, oh, and I went, ah, and I went. <laughs> So I have not met Dion Brandt, <laughs> but when I do, I will say, I, nice to see you, I am not the woman that fell at your feet and ran off crying. So. <laughs> She's right there. Don't say it! <laughs> for being a huge spoiler. Uh, <laughs> like my family uh, uh, will uh, block me on Facebook until they've seen the, the latest episode of Game of Thrones. <laughs> I'm just notoriously bad for spoiling. So, you know, I'm trying to be really good right now. <laughs> But, you know, there was, there was this one moment where, you know, the characters were discussing Wendy Williams' weave. Wendy Williams' weave. Yeah. So it's an old indigenous traditional story. Yeah. <laughs> Wendy Williams. <laughs> She's the Métis trickster. <laughs> Hard, uh, and uh, I was in the you know the city center mall in Kitimat. <laughs> <laughs> and when you're laughing like that, you better have a Bluetooth something. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't, so it just looked like, <laughs> yeah, that's Eden. <laughs> I think people know when you're in the building at any point in time. Um, we, I had Eden uh, at the University of Toronto for, for uh, the Indigenous Writers Gathering the first time. Um, and so we were upstairs. So in, in, at First Nations House, it's on the third floor, and there's all these uh, you know, different classrooms. And so Eden was at the uh, up top on the third floor, and we were have, probably having a serious conversation. <laughs> but she was laughing, as she does sometimes. And, a uh, professor came up from the first floor and was like, Can, what is going on up here? Can you please keep it down? I'm, I'm trying to teach this creative writing class. And I was like, oh, honey. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Do I have a funny irony for you? <laughs> Eden Robinson. And then they were just like, you know, do whatever you want, Eden Robinson. <laughs> Which is what I say all the time. <laughs> We're gonna be here taxes. <laughs> oh no! Oh no! I told you this. I'm oh. gonna tell you like a, a like you know. We're going to match an organizational system to your personality. Oh. <laughs> We're going to have a recondo your... <laughs> oh, my God. I... You're going to have to pick up every receipt and thank it. No. <laughs> I, I told Eden before I came here, I literally gave the guy who does my taxes, usually I give him like a big file or like an envelope, and this year I just gave him like the drawer out of my dresser <laughs> because I couldn't organize him, so this is why Eden is tormenting me, which she finds hilarious <laughs> because she has done her, you've done your taxes, haven't you? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we could do the envelope system. I 
can do that. I can do, but they have to be those big on Yeah, that's the, yeah. Yeah. You okay. tack them to the wall. Oh, God. And then you take like a like a giant like sharpie. <laughs> okay. And then like there's like 13 different categories that you can claim deductibles on. Is it really? Yeah. Yeah, for for art indigenous artists. You can for indigenous art. Yeah. <laughs> They're like tobacco. That's a medicine. Well, yeah. <laughs> Put that one under like uh, professional costs. Professional costs. Yeah. Good. Because it's about your appearance. Oh my god! So I can get like a new bra. Uh, because only the last if time. you're going to show it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah, I think I'm the last person you should take tax advice from. <laughs> Microdosing. <laughs> hey, we're not going to talk about that anymore. You'd be so audited. <laughs> that would be funny, huh? You'd be like duct tape. What is this? You like for moccasins repair, and that's traditional. And now you're being oppressive. Oh. <laughs> I could like put in all the receipts for like for like red wine because dealing with colonization, right? That's a has its uh, own. Actually, we could put that under meals and entertainment if you discussed writing while you were drinking the wine. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. It's a tax class with Eden Robinson. <laughs> <laughs> Tricks on you. You thought we were going to talk about writing, <laughs> drugs, <laughs> porn, <laughs> taxes. So, kind of writing. It's kind of writing. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, have, I have an amazing accountant. Uh -huh. Uh, who's, who's amused by me? <laughs> <laughs> the first shoebox, he's like, no, honey. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I'm going to charge you so much, you'll never do it again. <laughs> do you remember the last time, I'm just thinking about how we go off. Um, so we were in Toronto at Harborfront. We were very serious. Yes. At one point, I really, really, really wanted to know what happened at like the with Google Analytics because at one point we had the entire audience Google the centerfold, the naked centerfold that Burt Reynolds did. Oh. Do you guys remember this? Because we had this. So we were talking about it, and I'll tell you, it wasn't related to something that was about writing. I promise. Um, and so it, it was a write-off. Okay, I'll tell you. So okay, so this here's the whole story. We decided that it would behoove, I always wanted to say that word on stage, it would behoove uh, the Giller to have a nude calendar of all of the finalists. <laughs> what? It was our, what? It was our great contribution to Canadian literature. We came up with it. We were, I remember we were. What they should really do at the Gillers is like, you know with sports, how they bring out like Gatorade? Yeah. Like the winner yeah. should just get like a big Gatorade dump. And dump it on like. <laughs> and then Elena should come out like with champagne and just spray everything. Yeah. We should do that. And then, and then people will be like, your Giller acceptance speech could be like, I'm going to Disney World. <laughs> yeah. No, we were, so we were talking about the nude calendar. And then we thought, maybe it's a bad idea because Michael Redhill is like a shaved werewolf. <laughs> but then we thought, I love him, I'm just teasing him. And then, and, but then, Essie Adoyan won this year. What a missed opportunity. Yeah. My God. Yeah. Well, I think it was like from the Calendar Girls. Oh, the, the yeah. movie, yes. like where they were, were we fundraising. I have no idea. <laughs> suggested it could be in the style of the Burt Reynolds pinup and then I said I think he had a kitten in front of his junk and Eden was like what is wrong? <laughs> Who would put a kitten in, in front of their genitalia? I think it's a teddy bear and I'm like oh who's who's crazy now? So we had everyone google it in the audience 
And then, um, and then, can you imagine, <laughs> right? It was a teddy bear. <laughs> this, but my favorite was before, before we did the, the Google, this elderly man who was sitting in the front, who must have been about 95, I, I don't know how he got in there. He might have been there and left over from the last <laughs> event. I don't know why, he's, but he's, he yells, you don't need a phone, it was a pillow. <laughs> and I was like, thank you for your expertise, sir. <laughs> But can you imagine, like, Google Analytics at that moment, suddenly, like, 400 people Googling Burt Reynolds' junk? What was in front of his junk? Yeah, it was for his Playgirl, sort of. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. So, you, okay, so you said writing in the second person was like reading bad porn. Have you written pornography, Eden Robinson? I, well, there was a lot more sex scenes in Monkey Beach, mm -hmm. but my editor's reaction was, oh my god, that was hilarious! <laughs> <laughs> That's what everybody wants in the bedroom, is laughter. <laughs> so I quickly pulled, like, everything, because <laughs> it wasn't the tone I was going for. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I know a lot of writers who like who who really um, you know who can like like my gifts are uh, dialogue menacing mm -hmm. moods and violence. Yes, yes, they are. You're very gifted. <laughs> um, and you know, I, I so I guess if you get violence, you don't get you know sensual scenes. <laughs> Sorry, have you heard of this Fifty Shades of something or other that's... <laughs> oh, we're talking about literature, so maybe not. I need a teacup. <laughs> that was that Wendy Williams coming out of me, I'm sorry. I was being traditional there. Um, <laughs> Yeah, our ancestors would be proud to be like, look at our girls. We're so proud of them. This is this is what we lived and died for. This. <laughs> so glad we gave them our stories. <laughs> there, was, there was a reading uh, where, like, it was like the first three rows were of like my my Heisley cousins, and the other three rows were the first three rows for my Heltzley cousins, and. Uh, they're always like, oh yeah, she's eyes. Like, oh no, 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 she's health sick. And uh, then I read, and they were like, yeah, she's, she's. she's. <laughs> <laughs> no, she doesn't speak for us, right? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Wasn't one of the puppet things. <laughs> Like there was a like a language board, and they were they they were trying to like figure out ways to have like little little stories um, uh -huh. uh, for the kids in high school, and uh, I was pitching uh, like the the way the clan clan saved the world. Uh -huh. Like the in the beginning, the world was on fire, and all the animals were trying to get it out, but you know they they couldn't work together. So the chief of the clam clans uh, got all his sub chiefs together and decided that they were all going to spit at the same time, and that's how they put out the fire. That's why they're they've got little black bits. And uh, but I did it with like uh, like uh, clam and cockle shells with googly eyes. <laughs> <laughs> And my, you know, my high school's not that great. So it was like, this is, uh, I looked up and, you know, it was like a sort of row of elders going. <laughs> <laughs> this is our future? <laughs> and they don't, they don't fire you from boards. They just never tell you when the meetings are. <laughs> You're not passive aggressively fired. <laughs> Ever tells me when. <laughs> so you're still waiting, clutching your little puppets. They're gonna call one day. Don't worry, guys. <laughs> okay, so the next time we get together, we need to do. You need to bring the puppets. Yes. 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 
Yes. And we might act out what we think the Giller nude calendar will look like with puppets. <laughs> You know, American Idol with, you know. You know. So people audition with their puppets? No, we could get, you know, get the writers to like sing their readings with puppets. <laughs> so no one's going to come to our festival. <laughs> The audience like spins around when they hear something that they like. <laughs> That's, is that the voice? The voice. Yeah. Okay. You're mixing up with pop culture references, Eden Robinson. You're kicked off the, actually you're not, we're just, I'm just not going to tell you when the next reading is. <laughs> but that's it. That's all we have time for. So. We're done. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you both so much. That was absolutely wonderful. I haven't laughed that hard in a long time. That was great. <laughs> I'm very grim. I will, I will never read one of your books again without picturing the scenes <laughs> cut up and tacked around your apartment. That was fascinating. As a reader of novels, I often wonder, how do people do this? How do they put them together? So that was a fascinating glimpse inside the way it works for you. Thanks again. I want to remind everyone that uh, Pulp Fiction will be out in the lobby selling both Cherie and Eden's books, and they have generously agreed to sign. So please meet us out in the lobby. Uh, we will see you there, and thanks again so much for coming.